Um, I've been here before, Nancy Klimas. I'm a clinician and a clinical investigator from South Florida, and where I represent an amazing group of scientists and clinicians that I get to brag about in part during this talk. So um, some history first about our group, I and mean, some of you may not realize this, but about six years ago now, a whole group of uh, researchers and clinical people left all their home institutions to roost at Nova Southeastern University, where they offered us the opportunity to be create a center of excellence for the care and education and treatment research, et cetera, for this disease. So we're very uh, pleased about that. We also um, study uh, Gulf War illness, the first Gulf War in 1991. One in three veterans of that war remain ill today, presumably from their environmental exposures that occurred during that war. And we have a, a very robust uh, research portfolio um, evaluating and better, trying to better understand that illness, which helps us actually conceptualize MECFS as better as well. Um, as a cl clinical group, we've gone through an interesting evolution. Everyone in our clinical group is board certified in internal medicine first and then has a specialty, a more traditional specialty. I'm a clinical immunologist and we have a hematologist, um, an HIV doc in the group and so on, historically. But as we have been treating MECFS patients, we found ourselves increasingly taking more integrative medicine approaches to the care of our patients. And actually, in the course of the last five years, we have four physicians and two nurse practitioners, and three of them are now boarded in integrative medicine. One of them's boarded in functional medicine. Both the uh, nurse practitioners went to get their PhDs and certifications in integrative medicine. Um, I stand the only one that is not board certified in my group in either functional or integrative medicine. And here I am giving this talk. So I borrowed their slides, so it's cool. <laughs> but I mean, I practice that way too. So I just hate board exams, what can I say? So, um, so this is our great big team. So we grew from just a handful of people, eight or nine people. We're now 62 people, roughly a third, that, that column over there, are all the clinical people, clinical research um, staff, and so on. So we're doing a lot of clinical trials, clinical intervention studies, in addition to clinical care and education. And um, I'm loving this university because they don't tie our salaries to making money. Um, they tie our salaries to education. And that allows us to be, I think, a much more fruitful um, place to help to um, teach. And I think Melanie's in this room here. Melanie Perez, one of our first year medical students. Wave your, wave your hand. <laughs> there she is, last row, of course, medical student. Anyway, <laughs> so, uh, but she's just one of many students that we've um, been mentoring over the, since we've arrived. And then we have a complex group of, of research scientists. Um, Dr. Nathanson Lubov here is a, the lead of our genomics team. Uh, Travis Craddock, who had to leave this morning, is the lead of our computational biology team. Marianne Fletcher there, who is the very first person in our field to discover the immune abnormalities in MECFS, um, directs the uh, Diagnostics and Discovery Laboratory. She's retiring this year, so y'all should give her a shout out. She's really amazing. And. Uh, <laughs> I think when you're in your mid-80s, you should be allowed to hang it up for a while and enjoy some retirement time, don't you think? But she's never, you know, I never thought she'd actually do it. <laughs> so anyway, it's cool. It's a very uh, in-depth group, and we have an animal research and cardiovascular research group as well. So we have a lot going on. This is our, our group at our last retreat, looking happy in the sun. That's December in Fort Lauderdale. Do come visit us. See, short sleeves, beautiful weather. But back to integrative medicine. So integrative medicine sounds special. It's simply medicine. It's the way medicine should be done. It's teach, taking care of the whole patient in the context of their lives, their families, and their society, and in the environment in which they live and the food which they eat. It's thinking about the entire thing. Instead of parsing it out into pieces, it's integrating all of the aspects of life into the health and wellness of the patient. That's it. It couldn't be easier. And it's exactly what we were taught in medical school before we decided that we would learn only one organ system. So um, it's sort of bringing it home. And I've enjoyed coming back because 
it was the, the circle that um, feels very right. But you see it starts, you know, with Aristotle and it moves forward. And I'm not going to, you can spend an hour just talking about that. But in modern history, it's become a thing with a certification program and an educational program and an evidence-based medicine background that's strong and good and really can't be um, challenged. Those of us in MECFS are used to being challenged, so the integrative medicine group that feels harangued all the time, I'm thinking, man, they got it good. <laughs> they've got it good because they've got solid, good uh, support, and they actually have an institute at the NIH um, to help support that kind of work. So, and there's been actions, there's um, you know, laws and things that have developed, but in 2014, NCCIH uh, was developed, this institute that really is the home base to develop the evidence base um, that's needed to continue to allow this field to grow and help us all prosper. Now, we also know that we spend an awful lot of money as a society, and you with MECFS even more, seeking treatments because what you got going is not working for you. And so you buy it yourself. You're on the web and you buy a lot of antioxidants or you buy some Chinese herbs, or you do this, or you do that, and you're out there, you know, shopping. And you're doing the, I have a cup that says, you know, something about my medical degree beats your Google degree. You're out there Googling. Um, your way into the best you can. And I appreciate that because you're not getting what you need. But um, I, I would encourage you to, to do that very critically and try to find the very best, safest things to do. But you can see that there's more than $30 billion a year of out-of-pocket spending in alternative approaches that in the United States aren't covered on health insurance. So what is integrative medicine? As I said, it's just basically the full circle. It's everything from more traditional medicine, you know, pharmaceuticals are fine, and integrative medicine, if it's the right thing to do, you do that too, to, um, to health, healthy foods or nutraceuticals. And in the context of, of understanding your, your peace of mind matters, your spirit, your community that you live in matter, and so on. And there's a lot of determinants in health. This is just a, a, a classic, from a classic textbook page in a pediatric journal, but it just goes to show that it includes your work, your educational environment, and so on, that there's just a lot of aspects that um, are the determinants of health, and integrative medicine's not leaving anything out. Now, you might say, how does this relate to what you've been listening to? Because you've been listening to this. You've been looking at the human body from its most tiniest little particle through its programming its production of, of proteome and, and its metabolism and metabolome, its cell function, and then the bigger organ, the, the organ systems themselves, and then that, and you've heard about biosensors today and the ability to measure things by biosensors and then further out into your social graph where you're co connecting some tiny little discovery here to some symptom out here that had to filter through all of this to get to the point of a symptom, right? And, and the better you do that, the better you understand the science of health and the science of illness and the science of chronic illness, which is certainly um, challenging. But in the integrative approach, you, you embrace all of this. This is not over there. This is a part of integrative medicine. And as these new tools come out, we try to use them clinically. The other thing to understand is you hear a lot about genetics. Genetics is your code. Genetics is what we're born with. But they say genetics is the code. Genetics loads the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. Many diseases like this. Um, Reiter's syndrome, you have to have BHLA-B27, but then you have to get this specific GI infection that triggers 99% um, of people with that gene to develop a chronic arthritic condition that's, that was triggered by a specific um, microbe. Right? Many, 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 many good examples of that. But it's more complicated than that because diabetes is a lot of environment gene interaction. And MECFS is a lot of environment gene interaction. When you're listening as a clinician to the history of the patients and you're saying, this one had a very clear post-infectious beginning. So that triggered something. I was talking at lunch today, someone who has a perfectly lovely house that has three inches of mold in the wall 
Well, that's mycotoxin. Shout out, told you I would. The uh, mycotoxins. Mycotoxins are neurotoxins, and they're nasty little buggers, and they can really cause a lot of trouble. And I have a number of patients whose onset was mycotoxins, even more whose persistence has been aggravated by a hurricane, roof goes, rain falls, mold happens, and now you've got a really sick patient that was genetically predispositioned. So these kinds of things are also things we think about. So the defining principles of integrative medicine are that every clinician's a partner with their patient. You're not telling people. You're listening, having dialogue, and coming up with solutions critically. And doesn't that sound like a doctor to you? I mean, that's what I learned in medical school. That's not integrative medicine. That's medicine. But reinforce that. And that we think, as I said, in this big way, way more than just this system and that, that we probe deeply into the systems, but try to understand it in the bigger, bigger context. Um, that we use conventional and, say, less conventional methods if we think they'd be helpful and less risky. And so risk is a lot of the assessment that's going on in the doctor's mind all the time. Um, try to use evidence-based things as much as they are humanly possible, and then use rational thought um, to help you in a field that doesn't have a single medical guideline yet, like this one, you have to use your rational thought a lot. You can't just go to some algorithm and plug your patient in and say, oh, this one's this, we'll do this, that, and the other. You actually have to be a thinking uh, practitioner. But there's another part of being a thinking practitioner. While we're waiting for the science to evolve to the point that you have really strong evidence-based direction, your doctor's sitting there with a sick patient having to do the best they can with what they got. And we can't be afraid to do the best we can with what we got. You can't just send the patient out and say, you know, I had a friend that had a cancer in her chest, you know, size of a basketball. Now, it didn't come out as anything anybody could figure out. It wasn't the right kind of cancer. It didn't have an algorithm. And you could have sent her out and said, you know, come back in a few years, you know? Maybe we'll know more. Or you could have said, oh my god, you're going to die if I don't do something. Let's get it done. So that's where we are with MECFS. You don't just send people out and say, you know, we hope to know more. You do the best you can with what you got. And again, that's just, I think, the definition of a good doctor. You're using the best sense you got. And you do, you do what you can. And good medicine is good science. You have to ask questions and be curious. That's why I love that my group is a research group practicing integrative medicine. You see an interesting case, and boom, we're collecting 20 of them. We're publishing the, the group. We're probing into the questions. We're starting a new line of inquiry. That's good medicine. And we all should have that kind of curiosity. And then finally, this is really important. You're not going to have good doctors if they don't take care of themselves, if they don't exemplify the very principles that they, they expound. They have to take some time, get their mind calmed down, take care of their own health issues, remember to take vacation. I am not the best example of this, but I'm trying. I'm trying to be better. So MECFS is um, a complex illness, as you can see, and it's one that's really amenable to integrative approaches because it's multi-system. You've been down this road. I'm not going to review with you that know this well, but this combination of immune, autonomic, neuroendocrine, and brain really sings to a whole body problem that has um, some central players. Um, and so as we learned today from the mitochondria talk we just had before this one, that um, seven minutes, I got it, don't worry. <laughs> the, that uh, mitochondria energy really matters, that energy is really um, can be impaired. There's a lot of bioenergetics work going on right now to say, hey, this is a common theme across all systems. Then there's neuroinflammation work saying, hey, anything up in the brain is going to affect all the systems. Big one, oxidative stress in the brain, pull it together there, pull oxidative stress in the brain promotes neuroinflammation. Now you got both things going. It's most assuredly a brain disease. And so integrative medicine can deal with this complexity and pull it together in a single patient in a visit and say, um, what should we be doing? So going through these systems as I just spoke. Um, and then you say you've got treatment modalities. So let's just start with diet. Food is medicine. Food is medicine. You heard it today in the microbiome talk. What an important thing to hear that you've got tremendous complexity and way more 
things going on in your gut than you ever thought about, and that is diet dependent. It's really important, and it's very easy to want to go to comfort food when you're sick, but comfort food's some of the worst food you can eat when you're sick, so you have to think about these things. But a big one for us is do they have food? Are they eating because they either can't afford it or they can't get up from their bed and prepare it? Are they living off of you know, lean cuisines and frozen things they stuck in the microwave? Um, you gotta hear this whole history and get to it. And that's really important. And then, is that you? Is that my five minute warning? <laughs> I thought we had to abandon the building. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> We'll talk about that later. <laughs> that is great. <laughs> now your microphone works. The um, histamine. One of the things that happens a lot in, um, in food is um, a lot of patients have mast cell um, activation syndrome or something in the spectrum. So their mast cells just blow up and do a lot of nasty things, and food can inspire that. But there's foods that have high histamine contents that can really inspire that. So it's something you should read a little more about. It's a whole lecture. But having food sitting around the refrigerator is not good for you. And then anti-inflammatory diets mainly say get the carbs as much as you can, those free, nasty, free, lovely things we just had, the cookie, sugar, potatoes, those kinds out of our, out of our diet. The supplements in, in um, integrative medicine try to focus on what you actually need, not just some sort of magic formula you could look up somewhere. But in general, you're trying to restore a bioenergetic balance. And we've discovered in many different groups, not just our group, but other groups, that this um, redox state, the oxidative stress system, this perfect little figure eight of energy production, energy cleanup, energy production, energy cleanup. If this little circle gets small, you can't do energy production. You just heard that in, in a lecture. But this has often got deficiency states underneath it as well as whatever else underpins this illness. And it can be replenished with, um, with um, antioxidants and foods. So those things can actually be measured. You can be precise, personalized medicine. What a clever idea. Um, but you can also make reasonable guesses um, at, at decent um, antioxidants. For example, NAC. NAC, N-acetylcysteine is a precursor for glutathione, and it crosses the blood-brain barrier. Very few antioxidants cross the blood-brain barrier. So NAC, um, Dr. Shungus just finished a study where he measured oxidative stress in the brain before and after an intervention, placebo control, lovely study. It crossed, it changed things, good choice. So these are kinds of practical things we grab from the literature, maybe before they're phase three, but it's very safe. It crosses the blood-brain barrier. You've got oxidative stress in your brain. Why don't we work on that? Ubiquinol, this is CoQ10, but it's the the um, form of, of ubiquinol that um, is the useful form before it's been oxidized. So it's the more expensive form of CoQ10, but it's in all the studies that we've seen so far, and they're not enough of them are big enough, it's deficient in, in, in general in MECFS and can be easily replaced. So there's some things you can do. Omega-3, which is um, an anti-inflammatory uh, anti um, um, omega fatty acid, um, down regulates TNF. Well, you've heard a lot about TNF today. So there's some things you can do in nutraceuticals. They're very safe. And then I presented a study yesterday where we picked out the people that had um, genetic predisposition to not metabolize their folate pathway correctly, and we gave them methylfolate. We jumped over the step that was broken. And indeed, we did improve folate, reduce the other pathway that would have been a negative pathway. We did the right things using methylfolate, practical kinds of things, but personalized. We picked out the patients who had the problem. So um, there's many different types of ways to approach things through nutraceuticals. Sleep, sleep is important. I don't have to say that, and sleep's messed up. We heard a lovely talk about that, about why that might be, and, um, but there's some things you can do that aren't drugs that improve your sleep. The temperature of the room matters because we bring cools as you sleep to inspire sleep. There's even a device that cools your forehead that's been marketed that's gone through FDA approval. There's just a little thing will mask you on your head that that um, chills your the frontal cortex down, which regulates your sleep. Kind of cool. Um, herbs, meditation, big thing. Get these screens out of your bedroom. They're the worst thing in the world for sleep. I mean, blue light is really bad for sleep, and that's part of the problem we all have is that we sit in there you know, doing stuff or having a TV in your room. So getting the blue light out or wearing the blue light filters, the glasses that filter it out, if you must use screens, get them off, 
get them out of your brain. Exercise. There's exercise and exercise. Again, at lunch this break, we just talked about pacing, how uh, pacing needs to be done ever so gingerly, very, very gently. It's not this five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, because you're never going to be that aerobic. It's two minutes, three minutes, three minutes. Oh, that's great. I can do three minutes. I'll do three minutes three times today. And then I'll do three minutes five times or 10, whatever. But you're never going to do and should try to do this aerobic march on to, to some sort of um, uh, major effort that way. You're a, I love this because it's sexy right now, an interval trainer. You're not a endurance trainer. So you're going to do interval work. And getting to the gym is an interval. So don't go to the gym. Figure out how to do it at home. You've already used up all your oomph just to get there, that kind of thing. Different kinds of pain treatments that can be very good. Um, you have a wonderful osteopath right here that wrote the book on osteopathy and ME, Dr. Perrin's book, uh, phenomenal. And then detoxification. I can talk in the hallway more about this one because my time will run out. But detoxifying is a really big deal. And detoxifying your body for the toxins. We think environmental toxins have a lot to do. We were asked yesterday, do we think this is getting in bigger and bigger numbers? And the answer is absolutely. More and more MECFS that's happening, at least from the clinical perspective, we just see a lot of stuff going on. Why our environment is poisoning us more and more. The stuff in our food, our homes are built tight. There's a, you know, this, these exposures to chemicals in our, in our homes. Our foods have Roundup in them. We got a blood test to measure that. I've never seen a negative test yet, even in the most organic person that has the chemical that's in Roundup. Um, is in, it's in the foods intensely. But then this is also this idea of detoxifying your mental state. Get the stress out. What do you need to do to do that? It's a very good thing for any disease, not just this disease. People should have this. Now, personalizing medicine is more and more possible. We order um, these kinds of studies. I shouldn't be having an advertise of a Denny company, but I, it's the only, only slide I had. I'm sorry. But this kind of thing. Actually, you can read on a chart like this, that just the very chart you were just seeing with the pyruvate and the energy production and all that, but in more detail, where the blocks are. And they put your your 23ME or SNP pattern on that, and they, they give you a personalized approach to that and say, okay, this is blocked here and there and there. And then you're reading that, well, yeah, I have that symptom and that, that, that. And then sometimes you can get some really good ideas about what nutraceuticals could jump over or what foods you should, should go. So more and more, these kinds of things are commercially available. Like at least five companies are, are selling their vitamins by doing personalized um, assessments. Is this you know phase three evidence-based? No, but I've got a patient right now I'm going to take care of the patient with what I have. And if they're going to give me something that's low cost and low risk, well then, yeah, I'm going to do that. Now, as a scientist, this is ridiculous. I shouldn't be talking like this. But as a doctor, I have to talk like this. You're with me right now, and I'm taking care of you right now. And I hope in five years I'll have an ME-CFS, perfect study that's done all this, and I will be able to throw you an algorithm and tell you what group you fit in. And that's exactly what we're working on as, scientific, as scientists. We're absolutely doing that work. Yay. But, you know, now is now. So we do the best we can with what we got. So we're developing the evidence to help back up some of these very low-risk strategies that help us treat our patients. And I can do, you know, a full-day seminar on many, many aspects of, you know, what to do with autonomics, what to do with, with you know, brain inflammation, what to do with this. Uh, each one of those is a seminar. But, but this sort of like the, uh, the beginning. But the traditional way is to go a study where you do A and B and C in different groups, and then A and B, B and C, A, C, and then A, B, C. And that's how you get combination strategies. And in integrative medicine, we're doing combination strategies. The problem is that's a really, really slow way to go. So in our research, we also, lovely, have a computational background where we can predict what A, B, and C should be and go ahead and throw out clinical trial designs. We're doing ABC versus placebo instead of trying to understand the elements um, to get there faster. Basically, I'm saying, well, if it works, we can figure out that later. We'll do the second study and, and uh, figure out the elements, as long as we're dealing with non-toxic things. If we had a toxic drug in there, you know, like a, a monoclonal, then I would split it up. But if I'm dealing with nutraceuticals, then I can go with combos, right? So that's basically idea, and I know that the tap tap is there, so um, this is, so let me jump all the way to my thank yous, because I was going to talk about those studies, but we'll skip them.
I knew that I was going to run out of money because they, they cut five minutes off my talk because you guys talked too much this morning. <laughs> I will say that our first um, more aggressive phase one um, evidence-based clinical trial um, is starting this summer where we actually have done this computational approach to figure out um, a combination strategy that we are trying to reboot homeostasis with by reducing brain inflammation. At the same time, we reboot the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. It's a clever little strategy. We're doing it in golf four illness right now. We ran through in vitro, animal, and now human. We're in phase one in human study, and we're getting some nice phase one results um, in this Gulf War trial. Um, so we um, raised some private money, and we'll start that trial in chronic fatigue syndrome as soon as the IRB tells me I can. They're sitting on it right now. So that's exciting uh, news for us on, a, on another path. So my conclusion, patients are ill. Our treatments must rely on what the best we got. Uh, there's consensus groups, clinical consensus groups that are now started in, in, the, in Europe. And uh, what can I say, call UK Europe for right now, right? For another until October. And then, uh, anyway, Europe and UK, and then there's uh, one in the United States, and they're trying to develop clinical consensus about what we mean about what standards of care can be from our clinical experiences, and actually come together and make that up. I, there's people in this room that have been very involved and helped fund much of that work, and we are very grateful to them. It's long overdue. That's exciting. Um, I'm going to say one more thing. I'm wearing the T-shirt because I don't think a clinician who takes care of these patients can't be an advocate, can't, can't have that distance and say, I can't be an advocate, I have to have my professional distance, blah, 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 blah. That's so bogus. It is our responsibility as clinicians to advocate for, this, for our patients individually and for the, the disease that they have. And so um, just say that I left my suit in the closet after you gave me my t-shirt yesterday because I said, this is a better outfit for, for what I'm doing. So I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much.